for the speaker. And uh, so today we are happy to have Pavel Safronov on Global Poisson, and uh, he will be speaking on complexified flow homology and scan modules. And uh, we especially ask him to be gentle with us. This is such a such a topic which, well, maybe not familiar for all of us. So, Pavel, I give you the floor. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. So uh, I want to talk about a relationship between complexified floor homology, which is a rather new topic, so, so I will try to be gentle, and uh, a much older topic, which is scan modules. And these are uh, objects of a rather different kind. So scan modules will have a very uh, topological definition in terms of some links, and then complexified floor homology, the current definition we have, is in terms of uh, cohomology of some perverse sheaf. Um, so so the, the relationship is not, yeah, is, is not obvious, let's say. Uh, let me begin with um, the, the old story of instant term floor homology, um, which was introduced in the 80s. So let's say you start with a closed oriented three manifold, and uh, you consider the group uh, SE2. Uh, and then, so, so, sorry, Pavel, do, do you know we see like the second half of your cover page and uh, right? The, yeah, that, that's, in, in, that's intentional. Oh, okay, okay. Fine. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll slowly be scrolling through. Um, okay, so you start with the closed oriented three manifold and you consider the turn sign is functional on the space of SC2 connections on the three manifold module gauge. Um, so, so this this function takes a connection A to an integral over A wedge DA plus two thirds A cubed. Um, you take the trace of that and then there, there's some normalization. And then this function, uh, this functional uh, is not real valued. Um, in, in general, it's, it's valued in real numbers mod Z. So large gauge transformations change it by an integer. Um, and then you can look at critical points of this turn Simons functional. And the critical points are exactly flat connections. Um, so flat connections alternatively can be presented in terms of Riemann theory correspondence in terms of representations of, of the fundamental group. So, um, so I denote this log k of m. So this will be an important um, set or a variety later. So you, you look at uh, what I will call the character variety, which is representations of the fundamental group of the three manifold into SE2 modular conjugation. And so far, let's just think about this as a set. Um, and associated to this setup, this gauge theoretic setup, there are two interesting invariants. Um, the first invariant is the Kasson invariant. Uh, it's a certain integer, um, which roughly speaking counts uh, points in the character variety, in the SE2 character variety. So it's, it's a sign count, but that's why um, it's, it's not necessarily positive. Um, and the correct definition is much more subtle than what, what I'm seeing here. And uh, it, it, it's an important invariant. Uh, so for instance, uh, Kasson used it to prove that there are topological four manifolds with no triangulation. And slightly later, um, Fuller introduced another invariant, which is kind of categorification of the Kasson invariant, uh, which is called instant on floor homology. And so this is the kind of classical SE2 version of instant floor homology. And the way you should think about this is that you have this turn Simons functional on the space of connections, and then you take Morse homology of this turn Simons functional. So what does this mean? It means that you write down some chain complex um, whose um, generators are critical points, and the differential counts flows. Um, Gradient, uh, gradient flows of the, of the functional, 
In this case, the actual implementation um, is, is a little bit more subtle. If you think about flow, uh, gradient flow lines of the trans functional, it's better to think about them in terms of anti-cell dual connections on the corresponding four manifolds, uh, M cross R. Okay, and uh, in what sense is this categorifying the Cas invariant? The Euler characteristic of instanton floor homology is twice the Cas invariant. Okay, and again, instant floor homology is very important um, in low dimensional topology in topology of three and four manifolds. Okay, so um, let me now say a few words about what's called complexified instant floor homology, or maybe an idea of complexified instant floor homology, because we don't at the moment we don't really have a true definition. Um, let, let me motivate it uh, in some way. So in the 80s, uh, we introduced this notion of topological twisting of supersymmetric field theories, or supersymmetric gauge theories in this case. And the very first example was that he considered this four-dimensional theory, which is called four-dimensional n equals two super gamma mills. Um, it's not important for what I'm about to say to know what it is. And then in a quantum field theory, you can look at Hilbert spaces of states on co-dimension one manifolds. So in this case, uh, you have a four-dimensional theory, so you can look at uh, Hilbert space of state, uh, states associated to a three manifold. And then by construction, it turned out that um, this Hilbert space of states is exactly in some terms floor homology of the three manifold. Okay, and again, this um, this observation was extremely important because later, uh, using physical arguments, Cyborg and Witten showed that um, this particular theory is equivalent to some other theory, and um, they introduced the Cyborg Witten invariants, which are related uh, in a complicated way to instant floor homology, but are much easier to compute which gave rise to Hager floor homology and so on. Okay, uh, but the story I want to tell is about a version uh, of this theory. So that there's, a, there's another theory which is called four-dimensional n equals four super gamma mills. And the idea, if, if you compute this um, uh, Hilbert space of states in, the, in this theory, uh, what you discover is that, roughly speaking, you should be looking at a complexification of the story. So instead of SC2 connections, uh, you, you're supposed to look at SL2C connections on the three manifold. And then again, you can look at the term sinus functional on the space of SL2C connections mod gauge. Uh, it's going to be complex valued. Um, again, large gauge transformations will change it by, um, by an integer. And then, yeah, you, whatever complexified floor homology is supposed to be, it's supposed to be more homology of this trans sinus functional. Um, and so, what, why we decided such a thing? From the point of view of manifold invariants, uh, it's believed to be a much weaker invariant than instant floor homology, so the, the SC2 version. Um, but if, if you know something about this four-dimensional unicorn sports super gamma mills theory, um, maybe you're familiar with the work of Kapustin and Witten, who, who shown that um, th this theory has close relationship to uh, dramatic representation theory, and more precisely, dramatic language duality. Namely, this theory has a special duality, which is called S-duality, and it turns out that the theory for group G is equivalent to a theory for the Langlois dual group. So we'll talk about this later at the very end. Uh, what are the implications? Uh, Otto, I have a very naive question. So now this uh, S term Simons is a complex valued functional. Yep. Right. So so what does it mean Morse homology? Right. You you what, what kind of flow? So what kind of if if your function is complex valued, what, what should I think about it? 
right? For um, real valued function, I can imagine Morse theory. What, what is Morse theory for a complex valued function? Yeah, so maybe uh, what, what I mean here is, um, let me maybe not be exactly correct, but uh, I, either real or imaginary part of this transcendence time functional. So really, I want to view SLPC as a real Lie group. Um, the, the, the fact that th this is complex valid it, it, it is actually important, but uh, it's not important for what I'm talking about here. Okay, thank you. So maybe, yeah, let me just correct it. Okay, uh, and so in my talk, I want to explain, um, so, so the, 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 again, the develop, whatever this complex setting of floor homology is supposed to be, it's supposed to be something quite involved uh, analytically, because you're supposed to study these um, more slow lines. And so at, at the moment, we don't have an, an analytic definition, um, but I will present some other definitions um, one of them is due to Abuzi's Malescu, uh, of what they call complexified instant floor homology. Uh, I, I will mention why somehow analysis is not important uh, in this complexified story. And then I want to also mention another point of view, which is in, in terms of the scaling modules, and then I'll uh, outline the relationship between the two. Okay. So maybe, are there any questions for about this introduction? Uh, yeah, I have a small question. If you take the real part, so then you are in the framework of real functions. So then why you cannot just apply the previous story? Well, you, is... you, you, so, so potentially you could try to define more homology. Uh, as, as you know, the, the, the most complicated part about more homology is to show that the differential squares to zero. Um, so that, that means you have to study the modular space of these flow lines and you have to compactify that space. Ah, okay, there are no flow, uh, flow lines because all, more, all critical points have the same index. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get to that comment. That's also true and I'll, I'll get to that comment. Yeah. All right, so, so let me begin with the topological definition, which is uh, fairly old, and this is the notion of a scale module. A priori, it has nothing to do with any kind of floor homology or anything like that. Um, okay, so, so this was introduced, uh, I think, late 80s, early 90s by Przeciwski and Turaev. So you start with an, again, oriented three manifold and a non zero complex number, uh, I call it A. And then the scale module is. Uh, the complex vector space spanned by isotopic classes of framed unoriented links uh, in the three manifolds modulo some relations. So let me explain how to interpret these relations. So imagine you have a link in, in your three manifold and you have some ball, some three ball in, in the three manifold. And then in the three ball, you see a picture for instance, like on the left, you have a crossing like that. And then what this relation says is that in this three ball, you can locally replace that crossing by a resolution, well, by these two kind of resolutions. Um, so that's the first, first relation. The second relation is that if you see an unknot, you can replace it by just the empty link uh, up to some factor. Sorry, I have a question. If was this about framing? Should it work like upwards? Or... Should, should it what? Sorry? About framing. You yeah. How's yeah. Read the picture, framing from the picture. Yeah, so, so this is the blackboard framing. And, and you can deduce from, uh, from these two um, relations. Uh, I will not get the sign right, but um, yeah, you, you can see that uh, basically you see, you see a crossing here, so you can you can see what what's going on. The um, so so this is, is something like 
uh, minus a cubed times. Um, so, so just for, from these two relations, you, you see that uh, there's uh, dependence on the framing. But, but here I'm, I'm using blackboard framing. OK. Um, so, so here are some examples of the computations of scale modules. Uh, and maybe, maybe it looks a little bit strange because this is a Poisson seminar. And I will later um, explain what's the relationship to Poisson geometry um, on the next slide. So, uh, so the first classical example is the skein module of the three sphere, which is the simplest three manifold. So the skein module is one dimensional. Uh, you can embed, um, so, so the first dimension is, um, yeah, so, so to, to, to see that it's one dimensional, you can embed the empty link. So this gives you a canonical line inside of the scan module. And you, you can also find the inverse to this map. So given any link, um, you, you can evaluate it to a number by, um, by certain um, not in, or link invariant, which is called the Kaufman bracket polynomial. So the Kaufman bracket polynomial is some multiple of the Jones polynomial. Maybe you're more familiar with the Jones polynomial. But essentially, you should think about this as the Jones polynomial. Uh, maybe to, to just return to Maxim's question, uh, the Jones polynomial doesn't depend on the framing, but it depends on the orientation. On the other hand, the Kaufman bracket polynomial does not depend on the orientation, but it depends on the framing. And, and then the relationship, relationship is some factor. And another example is uh, for the case of lens spaces. Um, so if you have lens space LPQ, then the skin module has dimension uh, the floor of P over two uh, plus one. Okay. So now let, let me. Um, so far, this is just some topological definition. Let, let me say how it relates to some geometry. Um, so the first sign that it relates to some interesting geometry is the following theorem of Bullock and Przeciwski and Sikora, that if you take uh, the scale module and consider it not for an arbitrary parameter, but for a equals to minus 1, then uh, what you get is actually, so for, first of all, it's not just a vector space, it turns out to be an algebra, uh, which, which is not clear by this definition because uh, there, there's no priori algebra structure. And this is the algebra of polynomial functions on the character variety that I was talking about. So here, uh, the group G is SL2. Um, so you, you can make sense of uh, polynomial functions on SL2. And this character variety is an algebraic variety, so it can make sense of polynomial functions on a character variety. OK, so, so you should think about this uh, in the following way. The scaling module that equals to minus 1 uh, is just given by, by polynomial functions on the character variety. And then when you deform away from A to, equals to minus 1, it's some kind of quantization. So one way to think about this is that you you replace the group by the quant group. And another way to think about this is in terms of what's called Bottom and Kravisky quantization. Uh, now, maybe you're not so into BB quantization. So here's a much more classical uh, quantization. So let, let's look at the skin module, not an arbitrary three manifold, but of a surface cross and interval, the so sigma cross and interval is zero one. Then the skin module is actually an algebra, and it's an algebra in, in an obvious way. So imagine that you have uh, your three manifolds, which is sigma cross the interval. Then if you have two intervals, you can stack them on top to on top of each other, and you have some links let's say from zero, one, some links from one and two, you can stack them together and you get, again, some links inside of sigma cross the interval. And this gives you an algebra um, structure on the skein module, as, which is known as the skein algebra. In general, this is a non-commutative algebra, 
But again, it turns out that at a equals to minus one, this algebra becomes commutative. And this commutative algebra is just functions, again, on the character variety now of the surface, of course, which is the same as the this three manifold. And as you know, the character variety of a, of a let's say closed oriented surface has um, a Poisson structure. So in terms of flat connections, uh, this is defined by TN bot. And then the Poisson structure, which, which is closely related to the one I'm talking about here, was defined by Goldman in terms of intersections of loops. OK, and then the theorem of Turaev and Bullock from and Kanye Bartoszynska is that um, the skein algebra is actually a deformation quantization of the algebra of functions on the character variety. The quantization parameter is again A. So A equals to minus one is the classical limit, and then you consider deformation quantization. OK. Um, let me mention some recent works on, on skein modules. Um, which are closely related to what I'm talking about here. So one work um, with, that I've done with Gunningham and Jordan. So the first fact is that, OK, so I'm, I'm talking about scale modules, which are some vector spaces. And then what does it mean to actually compute them? Um, they, they, they might be infinite dimensional. So what can you actually extract from them? So it turns out that for a closed oriented three manifold, this, the scale modules are all finite dimensional if this parameter A is generic, uh, generic meaning not root of unity. And second result um, by Karega Gilmer and Desher Wolf, which just came out this year, um, is the computation of the skein module of a uh, closed Riemann surface of genus G cross S1. Uh, so it's given by this formula 2 to the 2G plus 1, uh, the whole quantity plus 2G minus 1. OK, so this, this is some interesting invariant of three manifolds. But a priori, it has nothing to do with any kind of complexified instant floor homology the way I was talking about it. Um, what, motivate, what motivated us to try to relate scale modules to, um, to, to something like complexified instant floor homology was some, was some recent work um, on a topological field theory-like approach to skein modules. So, so again, there are many words uh, on that. Basically, the idea is that there is some, you should think about this as four-dimensional topological quantum field theory, which to a three-manifold attaches skein modules, to a two-manifold attaches some categories, and so on. Uh, so you should think about this as an, as an extended uh, TQ of T. OK. OK, maybe, I, again, let me pause for some questions, uh, because I, I'm going to switch gears soon. So in, in your story, the group will be always present, this G. Yeah, it's like uh, Chern Simons, which means that no home flare. Exactly, yeah. So and, and this result that I mentioned, for instance, uh, about fine dimensionality, fine dimensionality of scale modules, it, it is for SL2 or sorry, uh, for, for, for an actual group rather than something like Homfleet type uh, yeah, skein module. You, you can modify definitions of skein modules um, by replacing the category representations of the quantum group SL2 by something like representations of GLT, where T is an arbitrary parameter, and then you're supposed to get uh, the Homfleet skein module. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so let me. Okay. So this was one definition, uh, and it should not be clear how to relate to any kind of floor homology at the moment. But let me introduce another definition, which is which, which is a more uh, symplectic uh, flavor of symplectic geometry, and which will be more closely related to some kind of instant floor homology. OK, let me begin with uh, some story about Lagrangian intersections. And I will be talking about uh, holomorphic symplectic manifolds. 
so be before I was talking about even algebraic symplectic manifolds, but you can just work over the, uh, the field of complex numbers. Okay, so let's say you have a holomorphic symplectic manifold and two Lagrangians and L1 and L2 instead of X. Um, and the local, the local picture is that um, near one Lagrangian L1, the symplectic manifold is the cartangian bundle of the Lagrangian L1. And the second Lagrangian is the graph of a function, uh, the graph of a, of a differential of a function, ds. Or maybe more generally, it's a graph of a closed one form. And so if you if now look at the intersection of two Lagrangians, that means that locally, it's a critical logos of a function, um, let's say, from some u into z. And now to this picture, you can assign some invariants. And I want this invariance to look exactly parallel to the story with the Cassin invariant and uh, instance floor homology. So the Cassin invariant was some number. So let me explain how to attach some number. So if you have this Lagrangian, Lagrangian intersection, um, then you can assign what's known as the virtual count. Um, Maybe this goes back to Berendt and others. Um, and, and you can also uh, relate it to some geometry of the numer fiber of this function. Okay, so this is a number, uh, which is again parallel to the Cassin invariant. Now let me explain some complex or vector space. So if you have critical locus of, of, of a function, a natural thing to attach to a function is the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles. And then uh, there was a conjecture of Kontsevich uh, that this uh, perverse sheaf is closely related to, to the Durham complex. It was proved by Saba and Saba Saito. So if you don't know what uh, the sheaf of vanishing cycles is, uh, just think about the twisted Durham complex. Also, if you don't know what this run complex is, uh, it just means you look at cohomology of um, differential forms uh, with the differential uh, d plus ds. Okay, the, the twist being that you add this extra um, close one form. Okay. Now, uh, again, just like in the relationship between instant floor homology and Cassin invariant, instant floor homology gave you a categorification of the Cassin invariant. In this case, this further sheaf will categorify uh, just the count of points in the intersection. So if you look at the Euler characteristic of the cohomology of this further sheaf, then you get exactly uh, the virtual count of points on the critical locus. Okay, and so here I was talking about the local story. So just about this critical locus. Now, what happens if you actually have Lagrange intersections, which are not presented as critical loci globally? Um, well, so, so there was a theorem of Boosey that actually showed how to glue these perverse sheets. Okay, so you look at, again, this Lagrange intersection at one cross L2 over X, and locally, it's a critical locus, so you can attach this perverse sheaf. And then you can ask, okay, so what happens uh, on the intersections? Can, can you glue them? It turns out that you can't always glue them together. You need some extra data, uh, which is called orientation data in um, the work of Dr. Schlogerman on don't see tone variance. And in this case, it means you choose square roots of the canonical bundles of the Lagrangian. Okay, uh, so, so suppose you, 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 you choose the square roots of the canonical bundles, then the claims that there is a canonical perverse sheaf um, on this intersection, which in a local chart, so if, if you actually present this Lagrange intersection as um, critical locus of, map, of a function, then it is just this perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles. And moreover, this Categorification story 
also works globally. So if you take cohomology of this perverse sheaf on the Lagrange intersection, and you take all the characteristic of that, then you get a virtual count of points on the intersection. Okay, so this is a categorification of the number of points on the intersection of the Lagrangian. Um, so this is uh, related to a slightly more general result uh, by Brav, Busi, Dupont, Joyce, Chandroy, which was a precursor to this work. And so, so basically, um, so I will not say, say much about this, but th there's a notion of a shifted symplectic structure. So it's a symplectic structure of some cohomological degree. And a Lagrange intersection has such a structure, has this minus one shifted symplectic structure. And what those people showed is that on any minus one shifted symplectic given stack, not necessarily Lagrange intersection, you have um, such a perverse sheaf. Again, you, you also have to choose this orientation data. And this perverse sheaf was used to define uh, what's called categorified Donaldson Thomas invariants. I'm sorry, can I ask a, this is uh, Ezra Getzler, what is a perverse, yeah. I mean, I know, I vaguely know what a perverse sheaf is on a scheme, but let's say on an algebraic variety. What is a, on a manifold, what is a perverse sheaf on a, on a symplectic stack, on a um, derived stack? So, so first of all, the, when I say on the derived, uh, stack, I just mean on the underived stack. So on the uh, critical the load. Yeah, on the classical truncation. So that's a, that's like a, I mean, so is it's an some sort of equivariant perverse sheaf for some Lie groupoid. Is that yep, something? Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so, so this is some general story about um, the existence of this. Um, so whenever you have a Lagrange intersection, and again, what is important here is that I'm talking about holomorphic simplex manifolds and holomorphic Lagrangians. On the intersection, there is a canonical perverse sheet, which is related to categorification of the count of points on the intersection. Now, what you explain how, how can you, uh, you can use that to construct some invariance of three manifolds. And this is the approach of Abuzaid Manolescu, uh, who actually introduced this term complex bias in some for homology. So again, let's return to the general setup. You have a closed oriented three manifold, and if you look at the group SL2. Um, and again, let, let's look at uh, the complex transcendence is functional and critical points form a complex algebraic variety just because the group itself is complex. And maybe if you think about quotients by a group, you, you shouldn't think about this as a variety. Maybe you, should, you think about this as a stack. So, so let's, let's just look at the character stack, which is actually a global quotient stack. Now this character stack is, is or the character variety is quite complicated. It's, it's very singular uh, for, three man, for a general three manifold. And whenever you see singularities, um, you, you might look at um, the corresponding derived, um, derived space. So you can look at the derived stack. Maybe let me not say much about what, what I mean by that. You might try to think about some kind of DG schemes turn to those. Um, and then, um, so there was a work of Pontefto and Bakevitosi who introduced the notion of a shifted symplectic structure on a stack or on a drive stack. And again, what this means is that it's a symplectic structure of a certain cohomological degree. In this case, uh, the character stack of a three manifold has a minus one shifted symplectic structure. Um. Oh, just an eighth question. So this minus one shift, that's because of the dimension of the manifold, is it right? Yes, uh, that's their mark. Um, great. 
So yeah, so, so the remark is the following. If you, if you look at an arbitrary closed oriented n manifold, then this character stack has a two minus n shifted simplexic structure. And the most familiar case is when n is two, so you just look at the surface, then this is the classical moduli side connections on um, on a Riemann surface. And again, on, on, on the moduli side connections, there's that here box simplexic structure. So this is the kind of, if you like, an enhancement uh, of, of the symplectic structure to the derived stack. And also generalization to higher dimensions or lower dimensions. Okay. So, so, so now let, let me comment why complex Python stem floor homology, at least morally, is supposed to be easier to define than um, the usual one. And this is also the remark that Jan made. So, um, in order, again, in ordinary morph homology, you, you look at crystal points and the differential is given by flows. And in general, these uh, if you look at the flow lines, um, they can connect points which are far apart. So it, it's more homology is not something local on the critical set. But what happens in this complexified story, at least the expectation is that there are no inciton corrections, meaning that these flow lines only connect nearby points. And what is expected is that this morph homology actually shififies over the critical locus. Now, the critical locus of the transcendence functional is exactly the character variety. So, what you want is some sheaf on the character variety of the three manifold. And uh, global sections of the sheaf or cohomology of the sheaf is supposed to give you morph homology. So let me explain how, uh, how to construct this, uh, this sheaf. <clears throat> okay, so, so again, let's start with the three manifold M. And uh, let's choose what's called the Hager decomposition. So you decompose the three manifold, this is a closed oriented three manifold, into two handle bodies, N2 and N1, glued along a uh, surface sigma. Um, if you don't know what the handle body is, uh, it, just think about um, a surface of genus G embedded in the three phase, and the interior of that is, is a handle body. Okay, and you choose two such handle bodies uh, glued along a common Hager surface sigma. Okay, and also uh, it will be important to choose a point on the surface. And uh, let's look at the three ball um, around this point in the three manifold. So it's going to intersect the Hager surface along the disk. So it, from the point of view of the Hager surface, you have um, a point on, on, on the surface and a disk around it. And then in the three manifold, there's a ball. OK. so. As I said, there's a disk on the, on the surface, so I can look at um, sigma minus the disk. And so, so the, it was called sigma twiddle. And also I can look at the, instead of character variety, I can look at the representation variety. So recall that the character variety was um, given by equivalent classes of representations. So these are homomorphisms from a, from a, from a fundamental group into G, mod G, and representation variety is the same thing without modding out by G. So this is actual variety, there, it's not any kind of stack. Okay, and then the, the representation variety of the three manifolds, M, can be written as intersection of the representation variety of these two handle bodies inside of the representation variety of the uh, of the Hager surface minus the disk. Okay, so now let, let me talk about the symplectic geometry of this setup. Um, if you look at the, uh, 
arena, if you look at a closed surf oriented surface minus the disk, then it refracts to a bunch of circles. So the fundamental group is just three. And so the representation variety is, is just a bunch of copies of G. So it's G to the 2G, where G is the genus of sigma. And this representation variety has a Poisson structure. And this Poisson structure has an open symplectic lead. Um, Pavel, what's the Poisson structure on this g to the power of 2g? Uh, let's call it Fox Rossley or. Oh, so you make, oh, you mean you make some choices, right? Th there, there's a way to say the story without uh, the choice of an R matrix. And the output will not depend on the choice of the R matrix. Uh, but let's, uh, let's choose that. Okay. Okay, so, so then there's this Poisson structure with an open symplectic lead. So, so let's just pretend this is symplectic manifold. And then the character variety of the surface of the closed surface sigma is given by Hamiltonian reduction by group. So again, there's a group G acting on the representation variety. Uh, it has a moment map, which is given by the monodromy around the puncture. And then you take Hamiltonian reduction. And then these handle bodies, uh, representation varieties of handle bodies are actually, first of all, they sit completely inside of the open symplectic leaf. And second, they're Lagrangian. Uh, and in this case, they're just G to the G. Okay, so, so what you see here is, is exactly, if you forget about this, um, um, let's restrict, you can restrict the representation variety to the open symplectic leaf anyway, because if you look at this Lagrange intersection anyway. Um, and so, so you get the, exactly the intersection of two Lagranges in a symplectic manifold. So using this story about Lagrange intersections and perverse sheaves, um, you can construct a perverse sheaf on this Lagrange intersection. In this case, a perverse sheaf on the representation variety of the three manifolds. Okay, and then, uh, so Abuzid Manolesk introduced two invariants. One of them is, is called just complex fighting stone floor homology. What I'm talking about here is what they call framed uh, complex fighting stone floor homology. And framing refers to the extra choice of a point I made. There is a more invariant notion and a kind of more correct notion where you don't choose this point. Uh, but then you have to work with stacks and so on. So that's more complicated. So I'm just going to do a simple version. Okay, and this framed uh, complex binding stone floor homology, which they call HP, uh, well, it's the cohomology of this perverse sheaf on the Lagrange intersection. Again, the representation variety is Lagrange intersection. Uh, by this work of Boosie, there, there's a per canonical perverse sheaf, and you can look at the cohomology of that. In the way I define it, um, I ask to uh, to choose a Hegar decomposition. You can you can ask, well, does it depend on the Hegar decomposition? Uh, the theorem of opposite Malesko is that it actually does not depend on the choice of a Hegar decomposition. So, so it only depends on the three manifold and a point. Okay, and then. Uh, the theorem uh, that I want to present, um, and this is work in progress uh, with Sam Gunningham, is that if you have a closed oriented three manifold and choose a point uh, in M, and you choose a generic parameter A, then the scheme module, which is some complex vector space, is isomorphic to the zeroth. Uh, Framed complex fighting stone floor homology as defined by Abuzid and Malinescu. Okay, so this is the, the relationship I mentioned between two invariants of a totally different kind. One of them is in terms of links uh, of the, in the three manifold, the other one is in terms of some sheaves on the character variety. Okay, let me also again uh, pause for some questions if there are any. Yes, I was wondering when you say independent of choices, 
is that proof by can is that a bit like showing that that uh, not invariants are invariant under Rademeister moves, or is it a more complicated type of discussion? I, I would admit, I would maybe even say e easier than that. Um, oh, I see. Or, okay. I, I have no idea how Hegard decompositions differ from each other. Ah, I, I, I see what you mean. Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm not completely familiar with that proof, so. Um, That's right, okay, great. Okay. Yeah, and I have a question. Depends on small point z. Is it kind of non-trivial local system on manifold? This HP. That's a good question. Um, I, I would. No, um, a, a priori you would expect it to be non-trivial. Um, I think one of the corollaries of this theorem is that it actually does not depend on, on, on the point. So it is a trivial local system, which is not clear from the definition. But just because the skin module is independent of the, of the point, then. Yeah, but it's only HP0, not all HP. Yeah. Um, yeah, you would, you would certainly expect this to, to be um, true for um, the whole. Um, uh, uh, is, is there any uh, a simplification if M is a contact boundary? Of, like uh, if, 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 if M, M is one? M is a contact manifold. M itself, it's a contact boundary of a four manifold, of, of say symplectic four manifold. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. So, so here, here I'm, not, I'm not using any kind of extra structure on the, on the three manifolds. Uh, so I don't know how, um, what that would give you if you if you change the, the, there are some recent works of uh, Eckholm, Shenda, you know, on floor type uh, uh, count with values and scaling modules, but only mm -hmm. for for contact three D. Hmm. Yeah, I, I I'm not sure. I I maybe have an easy question. What, what, what are generic A's? For, for instance, A equal minus one, is it generic? No, no. Uh, so generic means not a root of unity. Oh, okay. Um, technically, uh, at, at the moment, it's actually a little bit uh, weaker. Uh, it's not that, that it's not a root of unity. We work over the field of rational functions on C star. Um, so maybe you have to throw out more. Um, uh, so, so there are there, there is uh, the, there is this question in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Back to the previous slide about the uh, uh, symplectic structure of G to the power two G. Do, do do you want to say just a couple of more words? Right. I mean, one of the remarks is that G to the power two G typically has vanishing H two, so it, it it's not symplectic. But you probably have in mind something else, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, so, so this is this, this comment that you have to pass an open symplectic leaf. Um, th then it it will be it, it will be symplectic there. It, it's not going to be symplectic on 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 the whole of G to, to two G. Um, maybe let, let me uh, maybe get mention some references. So in the case of G to the two, uh, th there's a work of Semenov Tanchansky. That um, sort of constructs this uh, Poisson structure and proves this claim that it has an open symplectic leaf. So, so there the name would be the Heisenberg double, right? Or, or, or what? Yeah, the, the, it's a classical version of the Heisenberg double, right? Uh, yeah, so, so another question was about uh, symplectic structure on, on the representation on the character variety. So, so here I'm taking Hamilton reduction. So that means uh, setting 
so, so I have to take the premise of the moment map. That means you close in, you close the, the disk, and then you mod out by G. Um, so that means you get, get actually the character rise rather than the representation rising. Okay, um, uh, Lisa, are you happy with the uh, with spiral sensors? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, okay, so, so let me kind of maybe accelerate a little bit. So I have ten minutes left. Um, I, I just want to give some general ideas uh, how the proof goes. Um, and some techniques that are used there. So you, you wouldn't expect the, the two to be related at all unless you relate them through an intermediate thing. And the intermediate thing is the theory of differential quantization modules as developed by Kashvar and Shapira. So, um, so, so let, let's say you have a homomorphic symplectic manifold X, then um, you can talk about differential quantization uh, of, of that manifold, which means you look at the sheaf of functions and you write down the star product of that on, on, on the sheaf, uh, which means it's some power series in H bar, mod H bar, um, you just get the original products so it's commutative, and then the first order uh, deformation is given by the Poisson bucket. So that's, that's the usual deformation quantization algebra. Uh, slightly more complicated notion is the deformation quantization algebraoid. Um, and it's the following structure. So, so let's say you have a cover um, of your symplectic manifold. And then on, on the cover, you, you do have uh, star products. So you have these uh, sheets of algebras. And then there are isomorphism, isomorphisms on the intersection. But on the triple intersection, they don't quite, uh, they're not quite compatible, but the failure is given by an inner automorphism of the algebra. So what this means is that they don't glue into a sheaf of algebras, but the category of modules uh, does glue into a sheaf of categories. So it, it makes sense to talk about modules over these objects, um, but, but it doesn't make sense to actually talk about global algebras. And then the final result, uh, in the contact case, this is due to Kashiwara, and then in the symplectic case, Olesel Shapira, is that on any homomorphic symplectic manifold, there is a canonical DT algebraoid. Uh, so th there is a differential quantization, not as, as a chip of algebras, but as an algebraoid. And of course, later th there was a more general uh, theory of Kanslevich about Poisson manifolds. Uh, another result is that besides just canonical quantizations of symplectic manifolds, uh, there are also canonical quantizations of Lagrangians. And here you see exactly the same kind of orientation data I was talking about before. So if you have two homomorphic Lagrangians equipped with square roots of the canonical, um, canonical bundles, then there are canonical uh, differential quantization modules over that canonical differential quantization module. Right? OK. Um, and um, and like one of the main theorems in, in this context is um, a constructability result that if you take these two differential quantization modules and take relative tensor product, maybe uh, you take the derived tensor product, then this tensor product is actually a perverse sheaf. Um, and the theorem um, that we're, we're proving at, at the moment, uh, which is a, a step in, in the proof of the main theorem, is that this perverse sheet that, uh, that's canonically constructed due to those works of Kashiwara, Paul Sel Shapiro, and, and Daniolo is actually uh, the same as Boussy's perverse sheet on the Lagrange intersection. Again, the, this, the input is exactly the same. You also, for both constructions, you need the same orientation data. Uh, where is um, the plan constant in this story? Uh, on one side, he, he seems to have it, and the other one, you don't. Yeah, uh, so it's, it's um, 
the, the isomorphism is um, you have to extend scalars on the, the so the boosted perverse sheet is indeed over the complex numbers. Then you have to extend scalars to um, Laurent series in H bar. It's it, it's the same kind of extension as appears in the statement of the relationship between perverse sheet vanishing cycles and just the drawn complex. Well, it's Maxim speaking. Um, yeah, so there was some terminological suggestion by Dominic Joyce about maybe year code is to replace orientation data by spin structure. <laughs> it makes yeah. much more sense, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, maybe in the interest of time, I will, um, yeah, okay. let, let me quickly say a few words about this. Um, another theorem that uh, we have to prove so, so this, um, okay, so, so far I was talking about holomorphic symplectic manifolds and perverse sheaves on these homework symplectic manifolds and so on. And this deformation quantization was in the analytic context. So you look at the analytic functions. On the other hand, the theory of scaling modules and the deformation quantization that appears there, uh, I will get to that in a second, is actually in the algebraic context. And then you have to compare um, differential quantization, um, let's say output of differential quantization, where you plug in algebraic functions versus the output where you plug in analytic function. If, you, if you're on a compact manifold, then there, there are some general Gaga type theorems uh, that say that th those two results are the same. Um, in this case, uh, this character variety or G to the 2G is not compact just because the group is not compact. So you have to work more. Uh, but what turns out that it's enough to have a, a nice compactification of this, of this representation variety. And a compactification of the representation variety, so one thing to, that, that you, you should do is you have to compactify the group. Um, Okay, and the claim is that, that you can actually uh, find the compactification of these representation varieties, um, which are log symplectic. And these Lagrangians uh, also nicely extend to the boundary. So you, you have uh, an intersection of two Lagrangians in a log symplectic manifold, which is now compact. And then we prove uh, a theorem that actually, um, in, in this case, also, the output of algebraic um, differential quantization is the same as output of analytic differential quantization. Okay, let me maybe skip some details. And um, okay, so, so now I was talking about differential quantization and what does it have to do with scale models? Well, again, uh, so your representation variety of the three manifold is this Lagrange intersection. And this, um, this Lagrange intersection actually has a canonical algebraic differential quantization written down in terms of quantum groups. Um, so this, this Poisson manifold that I mentioned, G to the 2G, has a quantization defined by, let's say, Gross and Schumerus. And then uh, you can write down easily the corresponding modules for the handle bodies. And a the theorem we proved with uh, Sangami Ham and David Jordan is that the scale module is actually a relative tensor product of these quantizations. Um, the handle body, the two handle body models over the quantization of G to two G, and that's essentially uh, all there, there there is for the, to the proof. So now uh, you relate scale models to differential quantization, to algebraic differential quantization. You use this Gaga type theorem to pass an analytic context, and then uh, you relate analytic differential quantization to Boussy's perverse sheet. Okay. And maybe let me just mention some uh, future work. So, first thing to say is that um, you, you can define both scale modules and this complex fight in some floor homology for any algebraic group. Uh, let's say reductive, uh, so 
there's an ocean quantum group. And you expect the same results, but our techniques in several places actually use the fact that we work with SL2. One of them is this compactification business. The other one is that SL2 is actually simply connected, which simplifies life. Um, okay, so this is the first uh, thing to say. Another thing to say is the slang of the LT I mentioned. So what we expect is that for generic quantum parameters, there's actually a Langlois duality between the scheme module defined for the group G and the scheme module defined for the, the Langlois dual group. The same example of uh, Langlois dual groups are SL2 and PSL2. So the SL2 scheme module is exactly what I was talking about. Um, maybe I will not say much about the PSL2 scheme module, but it's related to the Kaufman polynomial. And again, we expect this isomorphism of these vector spaces. Um, and maybe let me, let me finish by saying that we also are developing a derived version of scheme modules, which will be related to uh, the full complex five framed instant floor homology. So, so here, we're only talking about this year of instant floor homology, and then these derived notion scheme modules will capture the whole homology. Uh, let me stop here. Okay. okay. So thanks a lot. Uh, any questions or comments? You can. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I have a question uh, about it's sort of uh, everything without instant on corrections. Yeah, which uh, seem to you you work classically. Now, in quantum story, you also have the level which appears in this parameter k, and you can vary it as a complex number. Yep. Uh, which means that you introduce uh, an additional parameter to your perverse shift, and uh, probably there will be some instant on corrections. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, like you, you do not have gradient lines between critical points of the same index generically, but when your potential depends on the parameter, sometimes it's happened and you have some um, uh, um, disks between two holomorphic, yeah. yeah. yeah that's exactly what, uh, what, what people expect. Uh, in terms of quantum groups, okay, you have this quantum parameter Q, and then as, as you know, for Q generic, so Q not root of unity, this category just looks like representation of the classical group. It essentially, it doesn't depend on this parameter. But then, at roots of unity, it, it looks dramatically different. And then you expect uh, the same kind of phenomenon. Is it really the same thing? Like, because I'm not sure that the roots of unity correspond to this um, existence of, of, of holomorphic disks. So, Roots of unity correspond to integer levels if, if you're talking about like the groups. Uh, so, I'm not sure that it's it's in, it correspond to the integer level. It depends on, on the critical values. No, I'm not sure that it's the same. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, also I'll just peruse the question. What can you show page 13? That's what we missed. 13, is it? Yeah. Ah, ah. Is, is it? Ah, is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. More questions or comments? I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, so it's kind of a general question, but in uh, a bunch of these theorems, you have a statement like uh, scheme module equals to something. But once you pick, a, let's say, a generic value of A, that's just some vector space. So does the statement come with uh, a statement about functoriality on M, or is there something special about these isomorphisms? Uh, so, so, no, no um, functoriality of M is a little bit tricky. So, so this is going back to the question of Ezra. The definition of instant floor homology de depends on the, on the Hager decomposition. Then there's a theorem that actually Perushi does not depend. The proof of, of this relationship also depends on the choice of the Hager decomposition. 
we certainly haven't traced what's what's going on when you change the header decomposition, whether this isomorphism is actually canonical. What you would expect is that, that there's a there's a definition of framed in some or non-framed in some form homology where you just look at the character stack and you don't choose Hager decomposition, but you still have this perverse sheaf and you look at a hybrid homology of this perverse sheaf. Then that object is canonically associated to three manifolds. And then we expect that object to be isomorphic to the scale module and that isomorphism to be canonical. Okay, I see, thank you. Uh, Lisa, you question. have a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it? You, you, you need to unmute um, yourself. Yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, at the very beginning, you had a sum over flat connections of your closed three manifold. In other words, yeah. intersections of two Lagrangian submanifolds. What ha implicitly, you had a finite number of such intersections. What if there are infinitely many flat connections? What if the intersection is a manifold of dimension higher than zero. Can you handle that? You're talking about this compact case or, or the complex case? Both, actually. But maybe you, maybe at that point you were restricting to uh, to the compact case. So, right. So, so in, the, in the beginning, I was talking about this uh, castle story. In, indeed, um, yeah. the, the main difficulty in defining the castle invariant is that um, it, it, there, there, there's this problem that you, you might have uh, non-discrete character variety. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, so what, what's happening is that uh, you have this Lagrangian intersection, and then you have to perturb uh, this intersection to, to be a transverse intersection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and then that, that's how Kasten uh, defined it. So that's that's what you would do. Uh, no, no, we, we're not doing any perturbation. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so, so the, this this per um, yeah, makes makes sense without any compactness assumption. Okay, thanks. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, hi, Pavel, thanks for the talk. So um, in this, uh, actually, this is the right slide, the one I wanted to ask about. So you have here uh, these holomorphic Lagrangians, um, and then uh, you have uh, what looks like a category um, or, or maybe a two category uh, where where they are objects, right? And the Homs between them could be either um, a vector space or in this case, you have this perverse sheaf. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, I have a just two questions about this. So uh, the first is, if you uh, go to the real part of everything, just real part of the holomorphic symplectic form every and all of that. So how does this category relate to the you know, is there is there a receptacle for the result? Like, can we say that the result of taking the the real part is a Fukaya category of a certain type, maybe of Nadler Zaslow type or something like this, and that this is a uh, a functor? Yeah. So maybe even wait. Let me first say that. Um, the, this composition that, that you, you mentioned, this category actually hasn't been defined yet. Um, so, so you do, you do have home spaces uh, between the Lagrangians, but the composition of two home spaces has not been defined. Um, yeah, that, that there's like a lot of work by Joyce and his collaborators in that. Um, the relationship to the Fukai category, in, in, indeed, there are some expectations, but as far as I know, there are no, no theorems. Um, of a relationship between the, the, this kind of um, a, a, an approach to, to defining if, if you have two holomorphic Lagrangians um, and, and you're trying to find home spaces in terms of this uh, cohomology of the perverse sheaf, how that would relate to floor homology of the actual real, underlying real Lagrangians. Yeah, but if, if X is exact, I mean, if everything is exact, probably it's true. Probably what? Probably what, what Marco, what you're asking is true because everything reduces to the skeleton of X and then uh, everything can be described in terms of perverse, including the Fukai Academy. 
I see. And just a follow-up question about this. So what is the, uh, so if, if upon taking real parts, we're dealing with an A model, what model uh, is it that we're dealing with before that? So in this holomorphic symplectic picture, what model are we using? Well, in terms of physics, um, let, let's say you didn't just have homework symplectic, but you have a hyper Taylor manifold. Mm. Um, then what, what's happening is that the usual A model arises when you have a Taylor sigma model, the sigma model into a Taylor target, then you apply this topological twisting procedure. Mm -hmm. If, uh, and this is a 2D 2,2 sigma model. Yeah. If the target is not Taylor, but it's hyper Taylor, this theory has more supersymmetry. It has four comma four supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. And so what you expect is that, um, it, again, applying, you, know, like you, you are taking the A model with a hybrid Taylor target, but then this four comma four, comma four sigma model, it has new phenomena, for instance, the fact that the A and B, the B model are connected by a path. Mm -hmm. There's a family of twists uh, deforming from A to the B twist. Yeah. For instance, indicating that the, the A model of a hybrid Taylor manifold is actually a differential quantization of the, of the Okay, model. but it, it, doesn't that mean that, I mean, what you're saying is that it's really just the A model. It's just that the A model has additional structure. Yeah. yeah. So that means that the, the objects shouldn't only be holomorphic Lagrangians. Yeah, you, you have to, yeah, it, it's, you have to say what kind of, um, Supersymmetry require for for these like brains. These would be higher super super symmetric uh, brains. Exactly, it's like kind of like half BPS versus quarter BPS in this case. I understand. Okay, thank you. Um, more questions or comments? Um, now I, I still have a, like the following question. So you you didn't want to. To, to speak about this uh, scale module for PSO2, but could you say a couple of words? What, what, what is it? What, what's the difference with this? So like can kind of, uh, are these scale relations different or what, what, what is it? I, 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 let me say a few things about it. Uh, I, I don't know the um, kind of, let, let me say a general definition for AG and, and then I will concentrate on the PSO2 case. Um, mm -hmm. Just switch. So the, the general definition is that you look at not just links, but you look at ribbon graphs. So, so you look at graphs like this and edges uh, in the three map, edges on this graph are labeled by representations. Uh, so objects of uh, representations of the quantum group and then um, on, on, the, on, on the intersections, you have to, uh, you have to insert an intertwiner. And then, there, so, so this is a general definition for NG. Uh, to define it for, for a concrete group, you have to understand the representation category um, by genera generators and relations. So for uh, for, for uh, PSL two, what was happening is that it's um, uh, so for PSL two, it's generated by three dimensional representation. So it's enough to label uh, all edges by just a three dimensional representation, but th there is a natural intertwiner. Uh, there's a, like a if you think about cross products of uh, vectors in three space, there, there's an intertwiner. Uh, so, so you allow trivalent graphs. Um, so so th these are the kind of generators. So you, you look at trivalent ribbon graphs inside of your three manifold, and then there are relations. I don't know a list of all relations. Some relations are like anti-symmetry or Q anti-symmetry if you exchange two legs of this traveling graph. And 
uh, the other relation is like, if you think about triple cross product, it's written in terms of dot products. So, so there's a relation like that. Um, I, I think all relations just involve four points on the boundary, but I'm not sure. And, and you're saying it is a conjecture that this is uh, this is the same. This will give the same as the uh, SO two scaling module that you described in the beginning of the talk. Is it right? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for lens spaces, we more or less have a proof, but but. It, from the point of view, scale models, land spaces are the easiest examples. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, any more questions or comments? Well, if not, uh, thanks again, Pavel, for a very interesting talk. And uh, let me repeat that uh, this was uh, the last talk of this season. So the next talk will be in a bit more than a month from now. Uh, it will be Thursday, September 17th. And in the meantime, there are many other events. For instance, there is a highest structures meeting, virtual meeting at the Schrodinger Institute, uh, and it will be next week. Well, um, thanks everybody and uh, see you in a month from now or earlier. Well, thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.